Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Mark, you've got questions today. They're going to be a little bit varied, um, but we're going to kick off with one that is about a bolting horse. Uh, not a horse bolting under saddle, but a horse that is bolting in the long reins. It comes from Tracy. She's been doing long reining with River, walking him out and getting him exposed to things. And it turns out that he got a fright with something rusting in some plants that they were passing. He was a little bit on the edge already. And that's it. He took off. She tried to manage to hold on for a few extra seconds. Uh, sorry, if she had managed to hold on for a few extra seconds, he, she thinks he would have stopped. But she ran out of rope and off he went. And it took a long time for her to be able to catch him. She has gone back to basics with him, thinking that the correct answer to all of this is to avoid it happening again, to go back to following a feel, re-establishing his brakes and sensibility dealing with exploding boxes is this the best thing to do or do you recommend something else um what what i'm go to the saying the the best thing you can do with a horse is teach it to get out of trouble before you get into trouble um especially when it comes to like things like long reining and floating and stuff like that as um you know example very very you know actually I know this is off long running, but it's on that, that saying, but, and you said to me, you had an email come through Jenny about someone not sure about coming to a clinic with a, I think eight or nine month old foal. Uh, Cause it was quite a friendly foal and they said, oh, so we could pro it'll probably handle the float fine. And I say, well, it's not very educated. And if it goes in the float has one panic, it doesn't have the tools to get out of trouble, never been in such a situation. And it could be the one floating experience that stops it from floating for the rest of its life or will makes it difficult for the rest of its life so i said it's probably not a good idea it comes along to the clinic and that's the type of situation that you know we were sort of thinking about getting it there with a uh, different situation might be okay uh, like with a mum so but um so what i'm saying is the, the foal would have quite easily possibly got on the float but if it got on without knowing boundaries all those other things that's that that, that that it needs what's going to happen is it's going to run off and panic and, and and see the float as a big threat so back to long running uh once you so say what i say is it's a bit of a joke so everybody this is a joke not serious um <laughs> i say to people if someone asks me when my when am i ready to go up the road in the long reins or down the paddock in my long reins i say well can you tie the reins around your neck and they're like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, I don't want you to do that, but you've got to be able to trust that if you tied your reins around your neck, you're not going to get in trouble. And if you've got that much trust in your horse and that much trust in the education you've done on that horse, that you could lead that horse around with those reins around your neck, then it's probably right to go out in the paddock. So when you're in the the safe area most of your teaching long reining before you go out is how not to get into trouble so i spend a lot of time in the long reins backing and moving circles and backing and circling and going tight around the horse until that horse is so good at staying in between those reins and knowing that they can move softly this way with the hind quarter and the fore quarter and back and this way that there's not any bind that's been in and that hasn't got out of softly so you're just constantly moulding and manipulating that horse to just sort of like Play-Doh in those long reins that it can just roll around anywhere. You can wave a flag behind it. You can bang your leg. You can spook it a little, catch it in the long reins, and the long reins don't frighten it. The idea with the long reins is they shouldn't worry the horse. So if it panicked inside the long reins, so then it's still frightened of the long reins. It's still not sure of the boundaries, and it's not quite loose and calm enough at being centred emotionally centered in those reins and being able to stay in balance all the time without constantly getting out of balance and then back in balance and out of balance so lots of backing tight turns everything like that till the horse is really loose before you go forwards and then when you're forwards can you go forwards fast and then go straight or back up without resistance all those little things are really important so if the horse panics to the reins outside that's a problem because it's the reins was still probably bothering it inside that's um so so think about that everything you can control has to work well 
and be able to get the horse out of trouble, uh, not get the horse feeling like it's still in trouble. So, so, so really work on lots of centering, man, manipulating the horse in those reins, touching it in different spots with the reins, handling it with a long stick while it's in the reins. If if the horse is that sensitive, you need to do that, uh, do more with that horse than than you know than than another horse that's been exposed to a lot of things like that. Uh, so the horse is completely comfortable with boundaries everywhere around it and not just dull to boundaries and just stands there still. It can move and roll around in those boundaries, all four feet are loose, no brace. Um, and then, then when you take it outside, it only gets a spook to something random, uh, but the reins catch it and it goes, oh, there's the reins. I'm happy with those. I like those. Not spook. Oh, crocky, there's the reins. What am I going to do? And panic. So just a bit more sort of, you know, back to the drawing board in the long reins. But when you're working those long reins, the horse should be finding centre, not you either. So, so you know, you know, as I say, you should be able to just sort of, t you know, I don't know, just if, if a dog took off with the long reins, the horse can follow them sort of thing. You know, that's how good the horse is. You know, you just drag that horse over here or move the long reins over there. Wherever you go those long reins, you shouldn't be able to walk around without even looking at your horse and your horse won't question the long reins. Um, and if you've done that, especially with the tricky horses, if it's a tricky horse and a nervous horse and it's, it's had all these little things in it that you've got to get sorted, then you've got to do more with those horses just to double double make sure that it's right because one day you'll be sitting on the horse and, you know, people go, oh, you know, you know, you know, maybe, maybe I'll get away with that. That's all fine. But... If you were sitting on your horse, it might have taken off with you. So, um, you know, so the reality is, is we will be sitting on some big, strong, nervous horses. So maybe we've got to get them really good before we get to that stage. And there's also a lot you can do with one long rein. You don't have to work yeah, with the, the double the one, pair. Yeah, the one rein is the, the prerequisite to just seeing the horse behind you and getting used to one rein down its side uh and then building to two reins but yeah they'd have to be super comfortable in two reins before you expose them to all the scary things outside next question is about a reactive horse as well this time it's a young warm blood it comes from marita she has been started and is going nicely at home but when she takes her to a new environment she's very reactive she runs around marita she can rear up and she's just not great at standing in the yard when she leaves her to do something. She mm. says it's almost like separation anxiety, but she's not sure what to do, and it can be really stressful. Have you got any tips for her on that? Yes. I don't exactly know. I'll give you <laughs> some tips because I don't exactly know um, the whole scenario in the sense of how she's operating when she feels good at home. Uh, I did a lesson, just an online lesson yesterday, and there's a warm blood that um, I've been helping over in Germany. And that particular horse is a very quiet, nice horse, and he's going not too bad on uh, out in the paddock too, like too. But he, he kind of just phases out and goes around like a normal sort of horse, you know, a bit on the forehand, kind of half listens to the rain sometimes, and you know, and and the, and and for half the lesson, we did not very much at all but when we did it he had to be on board 100 percent. and one of those things was just lifting on the reins and, and he had to wake up with the reins uh and then once he did that the owner went back to the backup and he went mm, picked up his life and awareness and did it really nice so what i'm saying is some horses are half phasing out and they're quiet when they're back back home and they're kind of not quite there. So they're taking in a bit of the information, not quite all of it. They're usually, you know, sometimes not really aware of what's going on. And and the lesson was almost like we might have done 15 lessons and, and the horse felt safe, but the horse was vague, not quite there. It wasn't taking on, you know, exactly all the information. And then when it goes out, it wakes up in a new environment and goes, wow, geez, hang on a minute. I'm, I'm a bit worried. So that often happens with the fairly easygoing quiet horses. They they sometimes get pretty casual, but they're actually not super aware of the pressure because they're a little dull and they're probably not as light and soft as they, as they should be. And then when they start hitting those boundaries of pressure and then all of a sudden we're on them, it's almost like, oh, crikey, oh, you know, and, and, and they get overwhelmed. So you have to make sure your horse at home 
is sensitive it's listening it's taking on the environment it's taking on you it's listening to the reins and there's this kind of vague area that a lot of horses end up sort of operating in a lot and then they end up and it's kind of like they're shutting out stuff and then they end up out where they're overwhelmed and then all of a sudden the stuff that we've been putting on them overwhelms them too because they haven't really been taking in everything that we've been putting on them whilst we've been at home so so that's one area uh Another area that causes horses to blow up when they go out is having them focused on us. So the, the, the horses that are a little bit timid, they don't search very well, they're kind of quieter because they, they don't go out fast. We tend to push them all the time a little bit and we might be sort of carrying them. So they're carrying our horse in the arena at home. You know, the horse is just listening to us like a, a beautiful, well-educated horse. But the horses that are listening to us all the time, if we don't watch them closely and they're not taking on their environment, they're actually just focusing on us the whole time. And then when they go out, there's all these other things that they, they can't not look at. So they go, geez, and I've got someone behind me and I've always been listening to them and, and I've had all my focus on them and I can't do two things at once. And I'm so what we're trying to get our horses to do is think forward when we go forward and not have to carry them with legs and follow the rein with their thoughts and not just move away from pressure. So when they go out, they're used to thinking like tapping into us with their secondary focus, primary focus on a task, sometimes primary focus on us, but they just flick their ears backwards and forwards the whole time. And that's how they should be working in the arena, not just in the arena they're like this with their ears on us because it's usually those horses that end up overwhelmed when they go out. And because they've been listening to us the whole time, they haven't been making decisions for themselves. If we walk away when we've left them somewhere, they don't know what to do. They're kind of lost. They're like, I can't do anything without you. So in, the, you know, in training at home, we have to get them to have their own bubble, have their own space, uh, follow a field, stand over there, walk away, come back. So they're thinking for themselves doing things for themselves with our guidance not just being carried around by our pressure all the time and if that makes sense to everybody then they might understand why sometimes the horses get overwhelmed when they go outside uh i mean there's so many things i could explain in this but i think that's the basis of um why horses struggle and so so i guess they feel safe at home but they don't feel safe out but feeling safe is not necessarily the horse being softly engaged and super aware of its surroundings and us. Mm, I think that, that's great. There's so many areas then to look into, Marita, and I hope that, that helps give you some bit of guidance of, w- of what to do next. So the next question is from Carla Mark, and it is about uh, trail riding, a young five-year-old again. And she asks, what can she do to encourage her horse to be a leading horse out on trail rather than always following? So Carla, is that's the question. Carla's horse is the one that uh, I was talking about that we just did the lesson in Germany yesterday. Uh, well, when you guys listen to the podcast, it might not be yesterday, for, but for me it is. Um, <laughs> but so, so basically, yeah, so Carly, uh, he, he's one of those horses, as you know, he fits into that category of getting a bit casual, you know, doop-de-doo, walking around checking out things, going there. Um, but he, he probably doesn't get, he gets his confidence by going to things, not necessarily taking on the whole environment and um, soaking it up as a lead horse. So, oh, I'm going to go to that horse. What's that horse doing? Or I'm going to go to the mounting block or I'm, you know, so they kind of slightly destinate and just target things and go to that. That's easy. It'd be like us going, oh, can you just lead and I'll follow? That's just easy. Easy days. Let's go. Uh, so what what I want you to think about is um, setting up ways that he can um, just feel good. Like if you have to carry him with your legs and push him through situations, he'll never get good at leading. Um, so we have to sort of, I, I, might, I, I might sort of say, maybe go out on your own a bit and spend some time on on your own outside on the rides so he's got to take in the environment and the other thing is try and figure out when he's kind of a little bit overwhelmed by something ahead of him and give him an outlet so if you're on a trail ride you can't necessarily always say stop go back let's try again because everyone's going in a direction and then you'll be the annoying one on the trail ride and everyone will hate you so sometimes you've got to go out on your own a bit uh, if you feel safe enough and get that horse to explore just you and him without other horses around 
And when you feel hesitation in him, so just remember, a horse is going to get more curious at thinking ahead if safety is behind it. So safety means the horse can step away from danger or move back away from the scary stuff, the overwhelming stuff ahead. If we keep pushing in it, and of course he gets a little bit slow or whatever, a bit quiet, we might tend to feel like we're just pushing him up the forest trail, but we're actually pushing him through all these things and he might just sort of block things out and not be very confident. So when you're riding him out, you might ride him out a little bit, he gets a bit overwhelmed, take him back a little bit, take him away and then turn him back in again until he can go, oh, all right, she's not making me go all the way out there. I can go back here if I get too frightened, if something really big happens. So I'm going to go back and be more curious. And then so you might, you know, take him out a little bit, bring him back, take him out a little bit. Um, you know, when you come to, to overwhelming things, even when you're leaving the yards, you might take him out, let him sort of go out in an area that he's not so comfortable with, but don't go too far in there, then bring him back again, take him out into that area again until he gets more confident at, at knowing that home's always available or alloyed territory is available. He can step back into alloyed territory and then he can go out in enemy territory as you go out. And soon enough, the alloyed territory gets bigger. He gets more better at exploring. Um, and for everyone, I think the biggest thing that we can do when our horse gets a bit overwhelmed, uh, being a lead horse or whatever, um, don't squeeze it when it goes, oh, I'm a bit slow and overwhelmed. Just use the reins, say let go of that overwhelmed thought, come back and then turn around and have another look at that environment that overwhelmed you for a second. And just by turning back and looking back again, sometimes it's enough for them to go, oh, I turned away, I let go of that and I came back and I'm going to have another look at it. Because that's what they do in the wild, if you think about it. A lot of times they'll see something and they'll run backwards or turn around, go away a bit, and then I'll turn around and have another look at it. But by being able to turn around, go away from it, and look back, and that thing that they're looking at hasn't changed, they sort of get more confident. And then, you know, like when you see cattle sneak up behind you and you turn around, they all run off, and then you turn around again, they all sneak up again. Um, it's almost like they, if they... If someone was pushing them from behind, they'd all split and run off. But because behind is available to, to move away in, then once they step back into that space, they have another go and eventually they come further and further towards their curiosity. Just a couple of questions to finish up for this week. Some rapid response questions, Mark. The first one is from Beth. Any thoughts on size or type of saddle that will give a better connection with a high withered quarter horse? Okay, so I know her saddle and it sits up high on the horse, lots of padding for the horse, lots of padding for the person. So you're sitting about, you know, a good fair few inches off your horse's back. A lot of well-fitted saddles, uh, so, so she's got a stock saddle, so you can find a good handmade stock saddle, sometimes second hand, but you need to find a good saddle fitter to make sure it fits along your horse's back. But a good stock saddle on a good tree uh, will sit close to a horse. Okay, a well-made one. You've just got to look at the different Australian-made ones and, and get the ones. So some of them out there, they're very, very generic. You know, even though they might be expensive brands, they sit high on the horse, uh, high up in the air. Even some of your um, bareback saddles, uh, not bareback, um, uh, treeless saddles, you know, I've seen some of them mm. that sit up really high with all the padding. You sit up above your horse. Um, so a good fitting saddle... I've seen some people in some really nice cavalry saddles and even though that's sitting on a, um, like a, it's suspended, they're still actually quite close to the horse when you look at where, where, where they're sitting compared to some of the extra padded saddles. But yeah, you can get a good, uh, um, you know, like I got an old Kent saddle. It's just a normal, you know, stockman seat sort of saddle, but it's, it's really close to the horses. I sit only about that far off their spine. Um, and I just feel I'm down in on the horse. Um, when you ride in a treeless or semi-treeless saddle, I'm not going to go into treeless and treeless, semi-treeless saddles and where their pressure points are. Um, a bigger horse saddles. float, better. She's looking at getting an angle load float. She doesn't have big horses. In fact, the horses are quite uh, on the small side, 15-2 and 14-2. But she's just wondering, would it make help them feel less claustrophobic or would there be perhaps too much room for them to move when they're travelling? Well, one of your horses, I think it's Kelly, uh, uh, Kelly I know. Yes, no. it's Kelly you know. Yep. yep. One of your horses is a little brumby. So you've got to remember that for everybody, horses aren't mice. They're not 
so good in tight spaces. So generally, if a horse has been exposed to stables all its life and, you know, all that sort of thing, they do cope better learning to stand in a horse float than a horse that's only ever been out in the open. Now, obviously, you know, horses in the wild, in, in, in forest country shelter, in, in more sort of claustrophobic style places, but it's never kind of like a cave really, you know. So, yes, horses struggle more with the claustrophobic side of things in small floats. Um, once a horse is not claustrophobic, as long as they've got enough room to balance, then they should be okay. But I've always travelled horses and, and, and if I just put one or two in and I didn't need a divider, I wouldn't put it in, in our bigger float that we used to, and, 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 and they had no problems travelling around. I'd travel them with loose and they could walk around if they wanted and they just travelled fine. They got good balance if they're soft when they're going. Like, uh, you know, some people think they need to be supported and they're going to go fall over and everything like that. Well, they're not. They actually, when they've got room, they can sort of balance and move a little bit. And um, But... What I try and say to everybody, like they say angle or straight load, and I say, well, on a long trip, the straight load floats have an advantage of length. Mind you, a lot of people put the, they've got, they've got all these shelves and stuff in the front and tack boxes or whatever, and then the whole idea of a straight load is having enough headroom that the horse can stretch out a bit if it needs to on long trips and not just be caught up with its head up against the wall. Unfortunately, a lot of modern float companies are turning these extended floats into extended floats with more, more stuff for the people. So the horses ended up got a got a shelf there, so it can't really stretch anyway. So there wasn't a point of having that extra space. So extra space for their horse's head uh, lowering is is quite. I think it's quite important uh, once they get soft and travelling, so they can put their head down a bit and open up their airways, all that sort of thing. Um, and in angle load floats with a normal size big horse, they they're too short to do that. They're kind of crammed up a little bit. So, you know, if you if someone's got two horses, I'd say buy a three horse angle load. Don't buy a two horse angle load because you can extend the the base size so you've got length enough the horse can stretch a bit more in a longer one. But the angle load feels wider for their eyes. So for claustrophobia, obviously the wider the space around them, the less kind of like frozen and holy cow, what am I doing in here? They feel so the angle load offers a bit more space visually but less space length-wise for them to stretch. So there's pros and cons in both those things. Um, so I'd say emotionally, claustrophobically, a bigger, wider angle size float is better. You can get straight loads now that are angle width, but the bays are pulled in, so the horse still feels like there's quite a bit of room around them, so they're pretty good. Um, but to be honest, a horse, I think, travel better backwards because, you know, if you jam on the brakes, the horse can push against a, a breaching bar with its hind quarter instead of, you know, constantly braking on that forehand all the time. So, you know, if you get an angle load, it'd be nice if you could make it so it's big enough that you can turn two horses around in and face them backwards and have your bays backwards. Um, not many straight loads are designed like that. There's one, one in Victoria that I know the lady got her specially built and it's a straight load where they travel backwards. So the breaching bar is quite a bit away from the back. And yeah, that, that she reckons they travel amazing in that. So, but yeah, you, can, you know, it's very hard unless you get one custom, which, which is gonna cost a lot of money. But yeah, more space makes them feel better, but just don't, if you do angle, don't have them jammed up too tight. Okay, great, great wise words. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for the questions to everybody. And uh, we will talk to you again soon, Mark. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. You can learn more from Mark and his approach online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. Join hundreds of others around the world making real progress, fixing problems and improving their relationship with their horses. There are now over 500 training videos. Make use of the seven day free trial and take a look. Membership is just $15 a month and you get to ask Mark a question.